Good morning. I'm Kirk Harriet, uh, Professor of Management in the Turner College of Business, and I hold the Ray and Evelyn Crowley Endowed Chair of Entrepreneurship. And this is part of our executive speaker series. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Chris Patterson. He's a local small business owner and entrepreneur. And Chris is the owner of Bricks and Minifigs, our local Lego franchise store. There are only about 15 of them right now in the United States, and it's a growing franchise. So pretty excited about him getting going. Uh, started here in the, in the area. I think he started last April, is that mm -hmm. correct? Um, he's actually been a resident of Columbus for the past 24 years. Uh, but he is not an American citizen. He is Scottish, even though he doesn't have a Scottish accent. Uh, I found that interesting because my heritage is uh, Scottish. Um, he spent the better part of the last 15 years working in retail management and direct sales for Nestle, Coca-Cola, and Home Depot, to name a few of the companies. Um, it was interesting in describing himself, he didn't spend a lot of time talking about uh, his career and some of the things he's done before uh, starting the store, he actually talked about his family. He describes himself as a very proud father and husband of two, he has two wonderful children, two daughters, uh, and in his free time, which if any of you are married and have kids, you know, there's not a lot of that, he likes playing with his kids. Not surprisingly, he likes building Lego creations, working on home improvement, not too sure I agree with that as a choice, but <laughs> and he hopes one day to be able to return to being an avid golfer, which is something he did in the past. Uh, let's give Chris a really warm welcome to the Turner College of Business. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. So, good morning. Good morning. So first of all, uh, thank you to uh, CSU, the College of Business, and uh, to Sean for uh, inviting me here this morning. Uh, I'll definitely have to say when... Uh, Sean first invited me, it was definitely uh, a little bit of shock and awe. Uh, I've seen the executive series. Uh, I know the people that have come before me and uh, that's some pretty big shoes. Uh, so compared to uh, everybody in the past, you know, thought process was uh, Sean maybe doesn't understand what I do for a living. Uh, you know, I'm just a small guy in a big pond and uh, through some conversations discovered that uh, Sean had had some great experiences and I uh, got some great feedback from some students that had worked with small businesses on uh, internships, uh, some with franchises and uh, what they had learned, uh, they seemed to come back with a lot of knowledge that maybe they not have gained from uh, working at a uh, big company uh, where everything's kind of compartmentalized. Uh, if you're going in for marketing, you're kind of in that marketing bubble, or if you're going in for accounting, you're in that accounting bubble. Uh, so anyway, hopefully uh, by the end of the next half an hour or 45 minutes, however long I uh, ramble on, hopefully not too long, uh, you guys have got a little sense for uh, small business, uh, small business management, uh, and franchising as well. Uh, personal goal of mine, just uh, not to see sleeping uh, heads out there by the time I'm done. So uh, hopefully we can accomplish those. So a little bit of backstory on myself, and uh, this is the boring part. We'll give you a heads up on that. So if we make it through this, we're good to go. Uh, as I said, I was born in Scotland. I moved here when I was uh, 10 years old. Uh, impressionable age. Uh, if anybody that's moved around knows it's tough as a young child. Uh, came in the uh, middle of the summer, so spent a couple of uh, months in those long summers in Georgia. You know, it used to be a three or four month break in between school. Uh, so spent a couple of uh, months of that just kind of hanging at the house, didn't know anybody, hadn't met any friends. We're a little bit outside of Columbus where my parents picked a house, so there weren't any neighbors to play with, and it was uh, right off Macon Road that used to be two lanes, so uh, you couldn't just go walk to the neighborhood or walk to the store to go meet anybody. Uh, so started fifth grade, made some friends. Uh, met one friend that was just an avid fisherman. So, you know, we kind of clicked, and of course I became an avid fisherman because he was an avid fisherman. Uh, couple of years we hung out a lot after that you know we parted ways ended up at different schools uh, that's when I kind of got back into or say got back into got in the golf uh, my dad was always an avid golfer his entire life and uh, that bug had kind of been passed on to me uh, so I spent weekends at the golf course spent summers at the golf course uh, before I could drive my parents would drop me off at the golf course in the morning on their way to work pick me up in the afternoon so I just played a ton of golf it was an absolute passion for me got pretty good at it uh, something my dad wanted me to pursue potentially in life uh, never really came to that uh, but kind of big change for me happened I think like most people you turn 16 and uh, a big event happens you get your driver's license in the United States you get your freedom uh, so for me 
that freedom didn't really amount to much. It turned into uh, me sleeping a whole lot. So I didn't have to have anybody take me in the morning to go drop me off anymore. I could get up whenever I wanted, go wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, uh, which amounted to me not doing a whole lot, slept a lot. Uh, one summer, I remember lunchtime, I can't remember if it was my mom or my dad at this point in time, but I got a very rude awakening when they came home for lunch. Uh, I was still laying in bed and uh, they came in Then I got a pretty simple order. Get up, get dressed, go find a job. So, pretty simple. So, I got out of bed, got dressed, grabbed the newspaper, got in the car, I went driving looking for jobs. Uh, so, first place I went to, uh, first on the list, there was a vet clinic not too far from the house. Uh, they were advertising in the paper, went and talked to the owner, the vet, and uh, somehow managed to convince him that I was going to be a good fit for his job. Uh, he hired me on the spot, gave me a schedule for the next couple of days, and uh, there it was, showed up and started working. So, vet clinic introduction job isn't all that great and fancy. Uh, started off uh, cleaning up behind dogs, cleaning runs, cleaning kennels, whatever mess was in the uh, building, it was my job to clean it up. Now, throughout the course of a couple of years, that changed. Got to help the vet in the room with patients, got the help assisting in surgery, learned about some uh, kind of specifics and behind it, how animals were treated and what you needed to do. So absolutely very educational job for the first couple of years I was there. Uh, now the vet started to make some business changes. You know, he needed to evolve. Columbus was growing. There was a lot more vet clinics opening up. And uh, being the kid I was, I didn't necessarily agree with how I fit into that picture. And I left to go find greener pastures. Uh, that's when I moved on to the wonderful job of a third shift gas station attendant. So that well, may really sound like a glamorous job, but it's not. Uh, I used to work three 12 hour shifts, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Now I was a student at CSU at the time. So around this same time, the schedule worked. I had uh, full days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I was a glutton for punishment. So I used to do 21 hours a semester. Uh, did it on two days during the week. Worked full time on the weekends and then had a couple of days in between to get study in or projects done and that type of thing. So, worked at the gas station for a few months. Again, like I said, wasn't the best thing in the world. A little sketchy. Uh, a couple of break ins here or there or robberies here or there. Thankfully, I was never in the building, but kind of decided to cut my losses and started looking for something else. Maybe a little more suiting and a little more long term. Uh, that's when I was able to get in with Home Depot. So, I think 19 years old, got a part-time job at the Home Depot in Columbus. Uh, started off in tools and hardware department, uh, something I already had a passion for. I enjoyed building and uh, hands-on, so tools and hardware felt like a great fit for me. A uh, couple of months down the road, I got promoted to full-time in the store. Didn't take very long. Thought this was great. Getting full-time pay, working all the time. Still managing the kind of balanced college life a little bit, so not too shabby. Well, about that time, they announced they were going to open the store in Phoenix City. Uh, I figured, hey, let me see what I can uh, do to get promoted, maybe take a department manager job. Interviewed for uh, one and got promoted into the Phoenix City store as a department manager. Month after that, they handed me keys for the store saying, hey, more responsibilities. You guys, you're going to be opening and closing a couple of times a week too. So you'll be the only manager in the building. So. 19, 20 years old, feel pretty good. You get handed the keys to a multi-million dollar business and uh, you know, you think you kind of know it all at that point in time. Uh, so I bounced around a while in Home Depot. I got moved from department to department. Uh, typically I, uh, they had some problems or you know, needed a little bit of cleanup, some areas that were struggling. I got moved in, did, started hardware and tools, went to paint, went to home decor, kitchen and bath, design. Uh, design was probably the worst for me. I knew nothing about it. Had designers that did the work, but uh, there was a communication gap. I was a hands-on tools guy. They're designing kitchens and closets and bathrooms and stuff. So it was probably the toughest post in Home Depot for me. Uh, by the end of it all, though, I was uh, running back-end operations for them. This was about the four-year mark in the Home Depot. Uh, so I was in charge of shipping and receiving, uh, did some work with the cash office, ordering, inventory, uh, and pretty much everything that happens on that back-end to make sure that the store is in stock and functioning on a daily basis. So five years hit. I was kind of looking to move up with Home Depot and this was when the market crashed. So Home Depot stopped building stores. Nobody was getting promoted. 
managers weren't moving from store to store. Uh, and it's at this point where an old Home Depot district manager came and uh, recruited me out and said, hey, have you heard of Big Lots? Well, I knew the store was in Columbus. I'd never been in it, so we sit and talk a little bit, uh, and he convinces me that uh, you know Big Lots is the way to go. Uh, so went in to start working for uh, Big Lots, uh, worked for them for a couple of years. Had a very tall order when I went in. Uh, if anybody's been in the stores, it's a discount style store, so inventory is ever changing. Uh, Obviously, with all business, you want to keep your costs low in order to keep the profits high, and that was the same translation for big lots. So, low payroll, high sales. Try to keep the profit, keep the shareholders happy. Uh, what that counted to for me, though, was 70, 80 hour work weeks for a year. After a year, my wife and I had our first child. The next year, I still continued working those long hours, 70, 80 hours, six, seven days a week. Uh, and what I realized by the end of that time, I'd pretty much missed the entire first year of my daughter's life. Missed first steps, missed crawling, almost missed birthdays. Uh, and it was that point I realized, hey, you know, the work has got to take a step back as the family is the most important thing. Uh, so I started looking for another job at that point. Started looking for something that, hey, I can have a set schedule. Didn't have to be a Monday through Friday, but something where I knew I was going to be home at nights, something I could spend time with the family, somewhere where it wasn't always on call. If somebody called out, I have to be the one to show up to go into work. So that's when I started with Coca-Cola. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time with Coke. Uh, I took a position as a route sales driver with them. So I went in, got my commercial driver's license, drove a truck, delivered Coke to the stores or vending machines or wherever they needed me. Uh, but it was Monday through Friday. I was home early afternoon every single day. Saw the kids every night. Got to spend time with, say, kids, kid at the time. Uh, got to spend time with them on the weekends. Every family event I was there, and it was great. So heard about Nestle after that. Nestle were hiring in the area. Uh, sparked my interest and uh, put in an application and ended up uh, getting hired for essentially the same job, route sales driver with Nestle. Uh, we did the frozen foods industry, so uh, Nestle's not just the chocolate or the, you know, Nesquik bunny that most people think, you know, there are a lot of brands out there. Uh, but we did frozen foods, so DiGiorno pizza, Tombstone pizza, haagen ice cream, Edie's, kind of all those big brands that typically everybody's heard about. Uh, so went in, spent a couple of years, uh, spent two and a half years on a truck. Uh, I'd gotten two national sales awards during those times. Uh, wife and I had, had our second child somewhere in the middle there and felt like, uh, hey, maybe I'm ready to get back into management again. Everything was smooth, spending time with the kids, spending time with the wife. We're there on the weekends for the family functions and said, hey, let's get back to this next step and maybe continue the journey of uh, work along with the family. So what that meant, again, was I was back in the position where working a lot of hours. I originally covered a team based out of Columbus and based out of Griffin, Georgia. Uh, that expanded. Uh, picked up Dothan, Alabama. Picked up Austell, Georgia. And for about a year and a half, also covered the Macon and uh, Tifton territories. So I was covering a monstrous geographic area. Uh, twice the amount of guys that I should have had. Uh, had 35, I think, drivers on the road at the uh, top point where most uh, District sales managers had about 12 or 15. So again, I found myself in a position where I was on the road a lot. I spent a lot of time in hotel rooms. I was leaving early hours in the morning to get up and get out to territories, and I was getting home late at night when the kids were literally going straight to bed. Uh, so I started looking for opportunities. Now, it wasn't something I wanted to find again, something that I could spend time with the family. Obviously, we still want to sustain quality of life uh, and where we were in our you know, personal side. So we saw, I spent a long time looking and nothing really came up. Everything that I found was the same. It was potentially the same bad aspects for me and my family position. It was going to be long hours that potentially got me away from the house. Uh, 
vacations, I think, uh, struggled as well during the time. I remember particularly one year we do a family beach trip, uh, my wife's family and her sisters. So there's 20 of us in the beach house. It's absolute chaos. There's uh, half a dozen or sorry, a dozen kids running around. Uh, but I remember the last year I spent the family vacation on a laptop on the porch of the beach house, sitting on conference calls and uh, taking phone calls probably 80% of that week. And that was kind of the final click that I've really got to find something else to do. Uh, but there was nothing out there that really sparked the interest. And that's when I started looking at, hey, what can I do to go in business for myself? What can I find that allow the quality of life and allow the flexibility that I need, but also sustain an income and something that'll be fun as well. You know, big thing in life is if you can't find a fun, if you can't have a job that's fun, uh, you know, it's probably a good potential to keep looking for something until you do. Uh, but that's when I found bricks and minifigs. Uh, I'd spend a lot of time researching online, looking through your usual magazines, Forbes, Entrepreneur, doing all your website searches, small businesses, what's the up and comers. Uh, and in the process found these guys while looking at potential uh, Lego store, uh, whether they franchised or not. Sorry, I'm gonna catch my notes up here. So the big uh, kind of roadblock was finding the money to start a business. Obviously you have to have capital, you have to have inventory, you have to be able to finance it, you have to show the bank that you are got a solid business plan in place, and it has to be sustainable. Uh, so I probably spent six, 12 months doing research. Uh, the closest store to Columbus was uh, Memphis, Tennessee, so it wasn't something I could just go hop and look at a store real quick. Uh, it wasn't like hopping into a McDonald's franchise where you can just kind of drive around the corner and you can find one and pretty much everybody knows what it's all about. Uh, so luck would have it, my sister decided she was moving from Boston down to Tennessee uh, through a PhD program at uh, University uh, of Tennessee up in Knoxville, UTK. Uh, so my bright idea is I'm going to fly to Boston and help you move down to Tennessee. Uh, went up there, loaded the truck, got her down, but in the back of my mind this was a thought for me because this puts me within an eight hour driving distance of seeing two stores. It's finally the opportunity that gets me close, took a couple of days off. Uh, so we get her moved down, we get her unloaded. I steal the car the next day. My dad had actually come up from Columbus to help unload the truck in uh, Tennessee. So we get on the road and we go see two stores in Kentucky, one in Louisville, one in uh, Elizabethtown. And I immediately fell in love. Now, my dad was the biggest skeptic of this talking about it, and rightfully so. Uh, I even managed by the end of the day when he saw the stores, he was convinced as well. So that's an absolute win in my book. If you can take the biggest skeptic and they see the vision afterwards, uh, I knew I was on to something. I knew personally I wasn't crazy because uh, it's definitely a big leap. So why bricks and minifigs for me? Uh, so Lego was a huge part of my childhood. Uh, I played with it for hours on end. If I wasn't outside playing as a kid, I was either inside playing with Legos, you know, if the weather was bad. Uh, it's an absolute ageless product. It doesn't matter if you're two years old or 80 years old, people have a love for Lego. They have a connection with Lego, whether it's grandparents remembering back to their kids, playing with their grandkids. Uh, or newborns that are just getting started. It's something that everybody can resonate with. Uh, it's educational. It's hard to beat a toy that can also educate you at the same time. Uh, it encourages creativity. It's completely limitless. Uh, what you can create with a uh, half a dozen Lego blocks is infinite. Uh, one Lego set's endless possibilities and, uh, you know, the root cause, I mean, it's art at the same time. If anybody's ever seen pictures online, I mean, people just make absolutely impressive sculptures and designs. Uh, you'll hear the word mock if you've heard Lego, my own creations, and there's just thousands of people across the world that dedicate a lot of their personal time uh, into Lego and the art, which is Lego. And the big thing for me, my girls got me reinvigorated into Lego when they started playing. They got that passion back out again. Bricks and Minifigs provided that business model which would align with the passion that had come back out from childhood. So, I think I've got my, 
small business dreams and reasons why. So I think everyone has a reason when you talk small business. So you want to be your own boss, potentially. You want to set your own schedule. Maybe you want to do it your own way. But sometimes the dream and the reality don't quite intermesh quite as uh, nicely as you'd like. So the reality is you can be your own boss, but you've still got a million rules and regulations that you've got to follow. You've got your local, your state, federal regulations, and these aren't things that are uh, bendable. You can't change them. Yes, you could lobby if you didn't like something, but uh, at the end of the day, it's rules that every business has to follow. You want to set your own schedule, but uh, ultimately your schedule is dictated by the consumer needs. Uh, if you're a restaurant, people eat at breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. If you want to be home at five o'clock every day, chances are the restaurant business is not what you want to go into. You may have a passion for cooking, but you have to dictate your business model around what the consumer's looking for. If you're a plumber, you're probably going to get calls in a weekend because, you know, someone's got a plumbing backup. They need it addressed right then and there. They can't wait two days because it's a Friday night till Monday to get that fixed. You want to do it your way and that's great, but there's HR and legal uh, responsibilities out there that we have to follow no matter what. Uh, if you don't follow HR and legal policies, you're going to find yourself out of business and find yourself in a position where uh, you know, you're in a lot of trouble, you, potentially legally, you may find yourself in lawsuits. Sorry, either I got my notes out of line or I absolutely skipped through a uh, slide here. So, One of the biggest, uh, we'll say hiccups in business is uh, you don't know what you don't know. And the hardest thing to do is find out that information and find it out from an accurate source that makes sure the information is good that you can act on. So challenges you can face, where do you go for help? So if you work in a big business, you can walk down the hallway, you can go talk to the HR department. You can dial an extension and talk to legal if you've got an issue. You can talk to marketing if you're getting ready to work an ad campaign and they can put together a campaign for you with just a little bit of information. Small business, every single problem lands on your desk. You have to be the jack of all trades. You have to understand what you're looking at. You have to be able to act on it. Uh, find out what information is pertinent and come up with an end solution. You can hire outside consultants and outside help, but all that comes with an expense. Uh, and then you still have to know how to audit the people that you've brought in for help. You can hire an accountant, but you have to know how to look at the numbers and understand the numbers in behind them. Because an accountant misses things as well. You have to know your bottom line. <laughs> Marketing, if you're having someone paying to put a marketing campaign together, you still have to know that it's going to resonate with your customers. That marketing firm isn't going to know your customer base like you are. You have to be able to go back and say, hey, this is not going to work because of this reason. And that's where so many small businesses struggle, is they're really good at what they do. They're a really good plumber. They're a really good chef. They're really good at building Lego products but they're struggling on the back end with the logistics of how to make it all come together with the accounting, with the marketing, with the legal, with the human resources side. I can tell you in the last year, I've learned more from opening and operating a small business than I have in the last 10 years of business. The last 10 years looks like a job orientation in comparison to the last year. So what is franchising? I think everybody kind of has an idea what franchising is. Uh, at its absolute root, franchising is a method that a business uses to expand and distribute its goods and services. Now, that sounds very fancy, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a way of expansion for a company that takes some risk off of them and passes it on to the franchisee. Uh, now, 
I think everybody drives past a uh, franchise probably every single day at some point. There's a Burger King down on the corner here. There's a McDonald's. Uh, there's plumbing companies in town that are national franchises. There's extermination companies that are national franchises. Long uh, care, car repair. There's just thousands of them out there in the market and you don't always think it, but these are locally owned businesses using that corporate franchising umbrella. So what's the advantage of a franchise? Why just not go off and do it yourself? You get that freedom of small business ownership, but you get support of a big national business. You don't have to have business experience. Most franchising uh, companies uh, have the tools and resources to train you and get you ready with that knowledge base. Uh, Franchises have a higher success rate than small businesses do by themselves. Uh, and you've got that established reputation. So there's a lot of great things about franchising. Now, there's disadvantages as well. One of the big ones, you now have a legal binding agreement with somebody else. It's not something you can decide tomorrow, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. You have a piece of paper that you're committed to this company for X amount of time. May it be three years, five years, 10 years. And that's a commitment that legally you have to follow up on. There's less flexibility on how you manage your business. There's a set of guidelines from the franchise that say, hey, this is the product we're gonna sell. This is how we're gonna offer it. Uh, and maybe this is the price we're gonna uh, make you uh, sell it at. Uh, prime example was uh, Domino's a few years ago, if anybody's familiar with it, came out with the $5 pizza during the week. Franchise owners were up in arms about it. They'd been selling pizzas for seven or eight dollars, depending on what you got, and all of a sudden, corporate comes down and says, hey, it's now $5 across the board. So if they sell the exact same amount of pizzas in that week, they're now gonna be losing money doing the same amount of work. So Domino's came in, looking for market share. So they weren't looking necessarily for uh, end dollars at the end of the day, but they wanted people to shop at Domino's to get the business away from Pizza Hut, to get the pe business away from Papa John's and the other pizza distributors in the area. So now these stores are doing more work to make the same income level that they were doing prior to that change. That's an example of one of the disadvantages that you can't, as a franchisee, have the ability to change depending on that contract and that agreement. Uh, there's no guarantee at the end of the, your contract that they're gonna renew with you. They may decide at the end of that five years that hey, it's not working out, Columbus isn't the location they want, it's bad for business, bad for a brand image and say hey, you're gonna have to go find something else to do because we're not interested anymore. Now, most of the time if you're running a successful business, if you're following the guidelines, you're being an ambassador for the brand, that's not gonna happen, but it's always a risk that there's no guarantees long-term down the road. So sales, service, and marketing. So big things to ask any business, what are you selling? Maybe you're selling food, maybe you're selling Lego, maybe you're selling your service to repair the house, maybe you're building furniture. Why are consumers gonna buy it from you? What makes your product better than everybody else's? If you're opening a restaurant, what makes your food better than the next person? When do you intend to sell it? Is it something you intend to do in the next month, in the next six months, in the next two years? What market changes are gonna happen between now and then? Maybe a good business plan today changes because in the next six months while you're planning, three more restaurants open in that time frame. If you're opening a Lego store in Columbus, Georgia with population of 240,000 during the planning phase, somebody else comes in and does the same thing. Do you really have a big enough market to compete? Who are you gonna sell it to? Who's your target market? Who's your target audience? It may not be one specific answer. Could be across the brand. We'll talk about that in a minute with a little, uh, couple of examples uh, for myself. And where are you gonna sell your service and product at? Are you doing it mobile out of a vehicle? Are you taking orders on a website that you're delivering in town? Do you have a storefront? Do you have a restaurant? There's a lot of factors that go into that and a lot of question marks. We'll circle back up to uh, why are consumers gonna buy to you? One thing you see a lot of small businesses and uh, a lot of mistakes is, hey, I'm gonna come in and open this business and I'm gonna be the cheapest provider of this service in the community. Well, that's great for a real short amount of time. 
people are driven by cost, but what happens when your competitor comes in and says, well, I can afford to match those prices, and I have more resources to keep it going. As a new business owner, can you afford to compete and take your product even lower without the business? Selling for lower is not always the best uh, business model. You've got to sell it at a rate that's sustainable, but you don't want to come in and crash a market either. So bricks and minifigs marketing, and marketing for me was the absolute toughest thing for me to wrap my mind around. I go online, I go on Google these days, I take a look at a couple of things if I'm looking for product. Uh, I try to be very informed as to what I'm looking for, so I don't look too much in the marketing side, I kinda know what I'm looking for, so I had a hard time figuring out how to market to people that didn't know that they wanted my product. So we've got several things in the store that we market, and every one of them fits a different category of people. We do birthday parties. We've got collectible old and vintage sets, old Star Wars sets. We've got current sets, Minecraft, Ninjago. We've got Duplo sets, which are sets that are geared for toddlers and uh, young children. Uh, we sell gift cards, so every single one of these, I can't make a blanket marketing campaign and send it out to the masses and expect to get any form of return on that. I have to know exactly what I want to campaign for. If I need to push birthday parties this month, how am I going to push birthday parties? Who am I going to sell that to? If I'm selling collectibles, who do I need to target for collectibles? So birthday parties, I'm looking for moms with young kids between five and 15. So I think we all know, and these are all, all gonna fall into stereotypes, but the mothers, most of the times, are the ones planning kids' parties and putting all the data behind it. Dad may be involved and may say, hey, yeah, this is great, or no, it's not, but most of the time, all the logistics, the mothers are doing that. Collectible and vintage sets is typically adult males, so I have to get out in front of adult males when we're looking at older products. <laughs> We're looking at new in box stuff like Minecraft and Ninjago. We're looking at boys, young boys, eight, 10 years old. We're talking about Lego Duplo sets. I wanna find parents that have newborns and have toddlers. Gift cards are kind of a bucket for everybody. Grandparents that maybe don't know what their grandkids are into. They know they like Lego, but they don't know whether they like Star Wars or Ninjago or Minecraft or Friends or Lego City. Uh, friends that are buying for birthday parties, aunts, uncles, uh, and pretty much anybody that's not familiar with the product. So in building marketing campaigns, we've got to be able to target in to exactly who we're looking for. Like I said, this was the hardest thing for me because I didn't understand consumer buying as much. I've been through some big jobs in the past, but truly understanding why a mother is going in for a birthday party. Why not do a birthday party at home? What do they look for? What services are they offering? Is a company offering that the mother is looking for? Do they want to be hands-on? Do they want to be hands-off? Do they want to walk in and not have to touch a single thing and just pay for it? Or does the mother want to be involved in the decision-making process? So benefits of uh, shopping small in your community. So small business and uh, reasons why you may want to do that. So small business shows that for every $100 that somebody spends in a small business store, $70 stays in your community. If Columbus is your home and you're thinking of going into business, support your local because you know that the money is going to stay in that local community. You take your large chains and your big box stores and non-locally owned businesses, less than 50% of the dollars you spend in the store stay there. Small businesses help bridge that gap that national chains just can't fill. Uh, studies show that communities with higher small business rates also have better economies. Small businesses account for 60% of the net jobs that have been created since the recession happened, and that number is just continuing. Nationally, small businesses do donate 250% more to local charities than chains do. So your local business that you may shop at, you may patronage, they're supporting your schools, they're supporting your sports teams, they're supporting, supporting your local hospitals. Uh, small businesses are known to give back to local communities, give back to communities that have given so much to them. At the end of the day, small business for me is all about building relationships. It's about 
the child that comes in the door that's just getting into Lego. Uh, it's about the dad that's got five kids who was in Lego his entire life and he's got a room dedicated to it and he's so happy that his kids are now into it as well that he can kind of pass that information down to them. Uh, it's about families and bringing everybody together. Advice for you, and these are some things that I've learned through career. It's not something I've learned necessarily in the last year, but in working with Home Depot and working with Big Lots. Uh, when you've done your research, do it again, and then have somebody else check it behind you. You can never do too much research, especially when you start talking about opening a business. Always do what you say you're gonna do. If you make a promise to somebody, if you tell an employee that, hey, I'm gonna get this done for you, make sure you do it. It's your word and your bond. Never assign a task to an employee that you're unwilling to do yourself. Uh, I think we find down the line, and if you've been in the workforce, when you move up through a company, you may have started at the bottom, you may have started pushing buggies in a Walmart parking lot, but a lot of times we see the gap over the years where people kind of forgot where they started. They forgot that, hey, I used to do that job too. If you're not willing to clean the restrooms in your small business, you shouldn't ask anybody else to do it either. You have to be willing to do every task yourself in order to ask somebody else to do it as well. Never leave a task until tomorrow that you can complete today. If you have the ability to finish a task today, why leave it till tomorrow? Because tomorrow, five more tasks may hit your desk. And now you have to decide which ones are important. And maybe that task that you push to tomorrow, you have to push again and again and again. And you end up with a task that sat for a week or two weeks or a month or two months, or maybe you never get it done and it was just a fantastic idea that you had the ability to do six months ago and you've still never had the ability or time to do it now. Never stop educating yourself. It's real easy once you get that job that you feel like you're gonna be in for a long time to just kind of put the cruise control on. Uh, it doesn't matter how you do it. Pick up a magazine, read articles online, find something that interests you. It doesn't have to be even be in your same line of work. Uh, read articles from people that own businesses. Read your Elon Musks, read your Mark Zuckerbergs, because maybe you're not gonna follow in their footsteps, maybe you don't wanna follow in their footsteps, but the management techniques and business techniques that you can learn, they've already been through them. It's kind of, let's not reinvent the wheel a lot of the times let's build upon what somebody else has already started. And make it personal. It's never about a boss and an employee. You'll see businesses out there, but it always has to be personal as well. Get to know your employees, get to know your customers, know what drives them, know what they like, know what they dislike, especially if you're running a business one day and you've got employees. If you know what drives that employee, you can help drive them to be successful. Find out what motivates them. Maybe they've got kids at home. Maybe they're saving up because they want to buy a car. This is their first job. Uh, maybe they're saving for Christmas presents or saving for that family vacation. When you can help provide context and motivation to an employee, there's no stopping them.